Welcome back to our second online seminar for the CMSA. Uh, it's my great pleasure that John Bamberg from EWA agreed to speak. He is an expert in finite geometry and we are very happy to have him here to give us a glimpse into this beautiful world. Uh, he will probably moderate how he wants questions himself. Well, Point. thanks a lot, Anita, and thanks, Nina and Anita, for organising all of this. Um, and all of you for attending, especially uh, those beyond Australasia. Um, so, yeah, basically, I probably won't be able to keep an eye on the uh, chat, as per usual. I'll be too busy. So, but it's still post questions there. There are people in the audience who can answer them. I can think of uh, three people who uh, should know quite a lot of the material. Okay, so basically this is a, about a kind of mystery uh, thing in uh, combinatorics. Um, something mysterious, crime parameters, they uh, arise from uh, linear algebra applied to the combinatorial situation. So you don't actually see what its relevance is immediately to the combinatorics involved. Um, it all began uh, for, with strongly regular graphs, I guess. Um, Bose Shimamoto 1952 and then further in Bose 63. And I'll just introduce what they are first for those people who don't know. Um, this, so this is a blackboard presentation, by the way. So I'll be trying to write neatly. Um, so it's a regular graph, a strongly regular graph. Well, my graphs will be sort of simple graphs and undirected. And it'll be K regular. And usually N will be the order. And it has uh, just one or two conditions. That's, that is that there are constants, lambda and mu, so that if I have two adjacent vertices, or two non-adjacent vertices, that there is a constant number of common neighbors lambda to these, this pair of adjacent vertices. So there's lambda here. And for the case where the vertices are non-adjacent, there's another constant, mu. And that's it. That's a strongly regular graph. And there are, I should make that slightly different. Let's put four there. Now, um, they arise whenever you have a permutation group that acts transitively as automorphisms of your graph at having rank three, so, and even order. So rank three permutation group. And this means that the group has three orbits on, uh, let's say the vertices it's omega, omega cross omega. So on their ordered pairs. Now, another way is that you could look at the point stabilizer. So I've got a transitive group and the point stabilizer has three orbits. So the point it's fixing and two other orbits. And this is, um, for a non-complete graph, about as symmetric as an automorphism group of a graph can be. So think of it as a, a large degree of symmetry for your graph. For the sake of this talk, uh, yeah, complete graphs and edgeless graphs will kind of be strongly regular as well. They're kind of trivial examples. Now, the other thing to realize about strongly regular graphs is that these two properties, the lambda and the mu constants, also give you other constants. And I'll describe it in the following way. So there are three natural relations, which I'll just index, you'll see the reason why, with zero, one, and two. So these three relations are equality, um, adjacency, and non-adjacency. I'll just call them zero, one, and two, just for sake of argument. And this allows me to represent um, these kind of intersection properties by this triangle. So I have my two given vertices, say up the top here, and I'm asking if these, are, if these two vertices are related by one of these three relations, so H is zero, one or two. So this means that these two vertices could be equal or they could be non-adjacent. 
then there's a constant number p i j h of vertices that are i related to your first given vertex and j related to the other okay and i j h are all 0 1 or 2 so in particular over in, over in this situation lambda is p 1 1 and mu is p uh, 1 1 2 okay but there are nine possibilities some of them are quite trivial in fact uh, i'll leave you to think about that k is also one of these numbers too as well but there are other constants and what's interesting is that you only need these two to to have all of them okay uh, and also the regularity and that's going to be abstracted in a moment because we're going to generalize this but first i want to give you an instance of where strongly regular graphs turn up in uh, finite geometry and my favorite example for today will be uh, the elliptic quadric q minus 5q and for the for the specialists in the audience, I'm going to cheat a little and just have Q odd today. Okay. So what you do is you have a six dimensional vector space over a finite field. That's over here. And we equip it with a bilinear form. So it's a bit like a scalar product. I've started writing one down. It's a little bit like the ordinary inner product, but we twist it a little bit at the end. So I'm going to have another little bit at the end here. Now, it doesn't matter what this is, it just uh, basically it will only have, this little portion here will have no um, self-orthogonal points, but that's a technicality. But you can rig this so that you get a very nice uh, geometry out of this, and I'll describe what that is now. So your geometry has points being just the one dimensional subspaces. Let's say it has representative U, which is self orthogonal under this form, uh, out of the whole form B. And the lines will be the two dimensional spaces such that each of their vectors in the, inside that two-dimensional subspace is also self-orthogonal, or alternatively, you only need to have that U and V are orthogonal under the form. Okay, because everything's a linear combination of, lambda U, uh, of, of U and V, and the bilinear form splits up and you get zeros everywhere. Okay, so the way I think about such a geometry is it looks a little bit like a big spherical thing in six dimensional space, which has some lines on it and points and nothing further. So it's only got points and lines. It doesn't have things like planes. And um, out of this geometry, you can construct a strongly regular graph. And the way to do that is to take the vertices just to be the points and two vertices will be adjacent if they're orthogonal or if they lie in a line, that's the same thing. So collinear. Okay, and the reason why I've written the word collinear down is that this is often called the collinearity graph. To emphasize the relation, the binary relation that we're taking. Okay, so, um, so imagine you've got the graph, it's a whole lot of it looks just like the points of your geometry, but the lines, for instance, would go to cliques. Okay, you could, you could have something like, your line would go to something like this. Okay. So there is, you lose a little bit. You sort of lose what the lines look like when you go to the graph, but you still have the relationship between points that, you, that perhaps is what you only care about. You, you lose some substructures, but you still retain some of the relations. Now, uh, an important tool in studying nice symmetric graphs is algebraic graph theory. And here is my 
the simplest one I could draw of a strongly regular graph, a pentagon, and we associate a zero one matrix to a graph in the usual way. We index the rows and columns by the vertices. And we place a zero, oh, we place a one in the matrix if um, the i and j entry and i and j vertices are adjacent. Okay, so uh, that's it's a symmetric matrix because we've got an undirected graph. And what's interesting about algebraic graph theory is that some of the things that we calculate for matrices, um, eigenspaces and things like that, can give you information about the graph. So in, in particular for this example, it has just three eigenspaces. And one of them is generated by the all ones vector, the constant vectors, one dimensional eigenspace. And you can see why if you multiply uh, this vector by A, you will spit out the regularity of the graph, which is two in this case. So you always get um, an eigenvalue of K for a regular graph. And you get two more eigenspaces, which I'll call V plus and V minus because the trace of this matrix is zero. So it has to be, and the, and the sum of the um, eigenvalues has got to be zero, it's got to be equal to the trace. So there has to be a positive eigenvalue and a negative one apart from the, um, the degree. And in this case, it's, um, it's a little bit complicated. So half times minus one plus square root five and half times minus one minus square root five. So for a strongly regular graph, you always get just three eigenvalues up to multiplicity. And the reason for that is you can describe the um, property of having these two constants lambda and mu in terms of walks of length two in the graph. And you can calculate them by taking the square of A. And so you get a relationship, you can write down the square of A in terms of A and, and the identity matrix and the all ones matrix. And therefore your eigenvalues satisfy a quadratic equation. The ones that, apart from the degree, of course. So um, the converse is also true. You have a connected graph, which has its adjacency matrix having only three eigenvalues up to the multiplicity, then it's strongly regular. Okay. Um, no questions at this stage. Now, there's, we've been talking about strongly regular graphs. Well, there's an associated association scheme. So that's the first part of the talk. So basically we have the three relations that I was talking about before. We have equality, adjacency and non-adjacency, and they can be reflected in terms of the matrices for each of those relations. They're all symmetric binary relations. So just as we made the adjacency matrix for a graph before, we can talk about an adjacency matrix for each of these relations. So we've got A, but we've also got the equality relation, which, uh, which we could write instead as the identity matrix. We also have the complement graph or non-adjacency, which has um, matrix J minus A minus I, where J is the all ones matrix. So if you think about it, J minus A interchanges zeros and ones in your matrix, then you've got to care about the diagonal. So you've got to get rid of the identity. So this gives you the adjacency matrix for the complement graph. In general, we will just think of this as being three matrices and we're going to start at zero. A0, A1 and A2, we'll see why in a minute. And we're going to put them together into a collection of matrices. And we'll have the following three properties. You can check this for a strongly regular graph. That first of all, the trivial um, property is that if you add all these mat matrices together, then you get the all ones matrix. 
Second property is that they are, are symmetric. So for the specialists in the audience, yes, I could do away with that property, but my association schemes in this talk will have symmetric matrices. Um, and the third condition is that the product of AI and AJ can be written out in terms of the AK. Now we don't have many matrices for a strongly regular graph, but in a moment I'm going to talk about other association schemes and this will be their defining property. So we write it down as the sum from H equals zero to D. And there are these numbers, guess what? P, I, J, H. So here's a reminder of what that means over here. And we put A, H here. Okay, so this property of there being these constants is um, you can show that it's exactly the same as this condition on matrices. So there's this beautiful thing that you could translate all the combinatorial properties to the, um, to the matrices and the product of matrices. Okay, so an association scheme, if you like, is a set of matrices which has these properties, but we can have more of them. Okay, that's what an association scheme is. And a strongly regular graph is essentially just an association scheme which has three matrices in it, or in other words, D classes. So often people in algebraic combinatorics will take one off because they don't like to regard the um, trivial relation. So we think about the non-trivial relations and that's how many classes it has. So a strongly regular graph is an association scheme with two classes. All right, so let me give you another example of an association scheme that's more general than a strongly regular graph. Johnson schemes, they're very easy. So you take all the K subsets, it's unfortunate use of letter actually K, but um, of one up to N. And again, we have the um, equality relation. The first relation that's we define is going to be differing in one element. Oops, start that again. The two sets will be one related if they differ in one element. And AI will be differ in I elements. And AK is differing in K elements, which is the same as disjoint. So you have all the ways, all the different ways that two K subsets can interact. And this forms an association scheme and you can write down adjacency matrices for those and they have all these properties. Um, in particular, the Peterson graph, or should I say that its complement graph is a Johnson graph and they form together a, um, an association scheme of two classes, J52. All right, now this property that we had on the product of AI and AJ being written out in terms of the AK with these constants there for coefficients also means that the AI and AJ, the two matrices in my collection, commute. Okay, so just from that description here, we see that AJ, AI is equal to AI, AJ because this, these intersection numbers are symmetric in I and J. So we have an elementary fact from linear algebra that the AI and AJ commute when they are sim simultaneously diagonalizable, when there's a matrix P which diagonalizes both of them. And then this means that when you look at the matrix algebra generated by our matrices, that we can find that there is another basis, uh, perhaps a nicer one, due to the spectral decomposition. These are symmetric real matrices. So the eigenspaces are mutually orthogonal. And in other words, this matrix algebra can be generated by the projections to the eigenspaces, which I'll write using the E's, E zero up to ED, or D of them. And they are often called the primitive or minimal idempotents. 
And as I was saying just then, the um, spectral theorem says that um, E, I, E, J, when you multiply them, is the zero matrix, and they are obviously eigenvectors. And that's, uh, that's a cool thing to recognize because now you've got positive semi-definite matrices as your basis for your matrix algebra. You can write each of these adjacency matrices out as a linear combination of these positive semi-definite matrices. And they have very nice properties. So in particular, there's this kind of duality Um, it's some sort of formal duality that reflects the definition of an association scheme. So the sum of the EI is equal to the identity matrix. Um, each of them is symmetric. And if we multiply two of them, but this time we multiply them entry-wise, entry-wise multiplication, so the Schuer product, then we can also write this out as linear combinations of the other, um, of the EHs. And so there are, these, there are these other constants here, Q, I, J, H. Uh, this is also the scaling factor, don't worry about that. That's just a, make, that's just a tradition. That it's these things down here, which are the crime parameters. And crime parameters go, oh, they basically, Leonard Scott called them crime parameters back in his abstract in the notices of the AMS in 1973, and uh, the name stuck. So they're called crime parameters because they also appear somehow in a harmonic analysis paper by a Russian mathematician called Krein in the 1950s. Um, but yeah, it was, it's basically um, goes back, it has its origins in permutation groups, these constants for rank three permutation groups, all the way back to Donald Hickman in his seminal paper in 1964. So what's special about these crime parameters? Well, first of all, uh, we know for intersection numbers, these PIJKs, PIJH, sorry, P, I, J, H. We know that these are integers and we know that they're non-negative. But what about these crime parameters? Do these constants have any restrictions on what they can be? Well, first of all, they're real because these, um, because we have uh, this condition here, we know that they have to be real numbers. But the other thing is that they are non-negative and that's the interesting thing. So that's a theorem. So the theorem, which was proved by Del Sartre in general for association schemes, is that the Q i j h are greater than or equal to zero for all i j h. And the little proof of this is not too hard, but basically we've got this condition that the so e i e j is one of the n, some blah, blah, blah. Now, if you multiply, or sure multiply again by EH over here, right? Then you pluck out this value here because this EH, if it's not if H is not equal to I and it's not equal to J, it'll it'll cancel them out. So you get zero, and so it'll actually pluck out this value for you. And the next, so these are eigenvalues. So one over n, I should say, one over n times a Krein parameter is an eigenvalue for EI uh, circ EJ. And so the, the next thing to realize is that it's a um, principal submatrix. So this is a principal submatrix of the Kronecker product of EI with EJ. And the Kronecker product of two positive semi-definite matrices is again positive semi-definite. Principal submatrix has its eigenvalues interlace the eigenvalues of this matrix. This matrix only has eigenvalues zeros and one. And so actually um, you can add more to this theorem. We have that they're between um, zero and one after scaling by one over n. So that's the basic idea of the proof there. So it's not too difficult, but it has a lot of applications. Now, one of the applications 
was by um, Peter Cameron, Jean-Marie Hutals, and Yap Seidel in 1978. And it's that if you have a strongly regular graph uh, with q11 equal to zero or q222, that's uh, which Richie Benoit's favorite crime parameter, if, if that's equal to zero, then for every vertex V, the um, sub-constituent um, graphs, like the induced graph on the neighborhood of V and distance two from V, so these are sometimes called the sub-constituents, then they are themselves regular, they're strongly regular. So an example of that is the Hickman Sims graph. So the Hickman Sims graph, which is associated with the Hickman Sims uh, sporadic group, has um, it's triangle free. So the neighborhood is the induced graph on the neighborhood is an empty graph. So that's allowed here. So when I say strongly regular, it also includes complete and edgeless graphs. And the distance. Uh, two graph is actually the M22 graph on 77 vertices. And that's also a triangle free strongly regular graph. All right, so what are crime parameters good for? Well, one of the, the first applications, I guess, was the non-existence of some strongly regular graphs. So what this means, strongly regular graph at the top here, is this is the, uh, this is the order, this is the degree, and this is lambda and this is mu. Okay, and this strongly regular graph, which you can't rule out by other means. So you know the complement of a graph of a strongly regular graph is strongly regular. You know that the uh, multiplicities of your eigenvalues have to be integers. You can try that out, but it passes all those tests. Um, and so you actually have to use the Krein bound uh, crime conditions, uh, which are listed down below. So this is another way of saying that the crime parameters are non-negative, where here is your degree and here are your eigenvalues of your strongly regular graphs. And, um, and the only way to knock out this strongly regular graph here is by the crime parameters, or actually there's one more that you can use what's called the absolute bound, but that's also related to eigenvalue stuff. Um, so the reason why is that this would have eigenvalues, well, nine is definitely an eigenvalue. Um, so nine, but it also has, you can calculate from the parameters, the eigenvalues, and you get nine, one, and minus five. And if you shove that into uh, the second of my inequalities to down below, then it should fail that. Uh, the other one is, this other strongly regular graph also wasn't known to non-exist for a long time. And then you can knock it out with uh, the Krein uh, parameters because it would have these eigenvalues. And this time it's the first inequality, you should knock it out. All right. Um, another application is uh, Higman's inequality. So this is for generalized quadrangles, which are a certain point line geometry, which, which have um, their, their collinearity graphs on the points and the concurrency graphs on the lines are both strongly regular. Now a generalized quadrangle, just quickly, it's got uh, parameters, uh, some, sometimes called the order, uh, S and T. And those parameters are, are there to give you the constant number of points on a line, which is S plus one, and the constant number of lines through a point, which is T plus one. And what Higman's inequality states is that S and T are not far apart. S is at most T squared, and T is at most S squared. And to see that, down below, I spent a long time yesterday, probably a couple of hours actually, computing the crime matrices. Um, so this is Jesse's idea, actually. This is like a cubicle array, uh, but cross sections of it. So you can get all the crime parameters by fixing the, uh, 
coordinate i. So i is zero for this matrix, i is one for this matrix, and i is two for this one. And then your other two parameters, j and h, are the entries of the matrices. And if you look closely, you have to look very closely, uh, it's their functions of s and t in there. And each of these entries has to be non-negative, but you have tautologies everywhere. I mean, this one's clearly non-negative and it's very hard to find a condition anywhere. But if you look really closely, you can see this one down here, okay? And down here, you have an S squared minus T on the numerator of Q222, Q222, yep. And the fact that this is greater than or equal to zero, implies that S is at most T squared. And then you've got that, uh, the dual where you swap points and lines of a generalized quadrangle is also a generalized quadrangle, gives you the second condition. So that's a, a one line proof if you like, with received knowledge of the um, crime parameters. All right, um, now the next significant result that, well, significant to me, uh, in this area is due to a paper of, which is already mentioned um, before by Peter Cameron, Kutals and Seidel. And they proved the following, but I need to give it a little bit more background down below. So if omega is the set of vertices of your uh, association scheme, the points, the underlying set, then you can construct a vector space, just the free vector space. Let's just use the complex numbers. Okay, so the basis uh, are, the, are the vertices themselves. And as we've already noticed, there's a, well, an orthogonal decomposition of this vector space into the eigenspaces, the simultaneous eigenspaces for the matrices of the association scheme. So I'm using uh, the perp symbol just for um, orthogonal, okay? Um, and each of these is the row space of the projections, okay, the eigenspaces. All right, so uh, that's what the VIs are in the, in the statement. So we have just a, a vector in VI, it doesn't have to be a zero one vector. And another one in VJ. And the crime parameter QIJH is equal to zero. Then when you take the sure product of U and V, the entry wise product of those vectors, then they're annihilated by EH, the projection to the um, eigenspace VH. And let's relate this to something that is less algebraic perhaps. If you take, um, a subset S and a subset T, you can take their characteristic vector, right? So it's a zero one vector, which indicates where S lies in your set omega. And that could be U and that could be V. So now uh, we have zero one vectors, which represent subsets. And what this sure product means is it's the intersection, right? So if I think of my zero one vectors, the ones are where my set S and T lie, then if I take the sure product, ones will only occur where they coincide. And so that's the intersection of S and T. And so this is kind of like a generalized intersection. And so what this is saying is that, which is kind of an interesting thing is combinatorially, um, these sets S and T, if they're in different I and J, are uh, sort of, um, they're, they're, they, they don't like each other inside of your graph or, or geometry. And this is saying that their intersection will also have, uh, have some meaning, I guess, some combinatorial meaning. All right, so let's do an example. Here's the higman sims graph. Uh, this is one that took me a long time to draw. It's got 100 vertices, degree 22. Um, if you want a better version of this picture, it doesn't look a lot different. Go to the Wikipedia article for, for Higman Sims Graph and it has a picture of the Higman Sims Graph. It looks almost identically to, to this one. Um, these are the crime matrices, or the crime parameters written out in terms of these cross sections of the cubicle array. 
And what do you notice? Well, there is a zero sitting on this diagonal here. And that would mean that Q111 is equal to zero. And that has a particular meaning. So what actually ends up happening is that, uh, so if you remember when we went back to Cameron, Hutals and Seidel, that if Q11 is equal to Q111 is equal to zero, then you get the subconstituents um, being strongly regular. But there's another thing that happens as well. And I'll give you an example of that. If you take um, a different representation of this graph, just as a, um, a Venn diagram, then there's a way to divide up the higman sims graph into two parts of equal size, 50 vertices each. And it has the following property that if you take a vertex in one of the halves, then it has a, it's a regular induced subgraph of degree seven. So the number of vertices adjacent to this, this one here is seven inside of that set. But from outside the set, it, you can see 15 vertices adjacent. And this is always the case. All right, so you just get two numbers, seven and 15. Now suppose you were to divide the graph up in this way. So this is what's called an equitable partition, um, such that this number is bigger than this number. Then because this crime parameter is zero, I can tell you that it would have to be a halfway partition. You'd have to have two halves of equal size. You can't do it in any other way. I can't make this uh, 30, 70 or something like that. It has to be 50, 50. And this does exist and it's called the, Hoff the Hoffman singleton partition. So these are each Hoffman singleton graphs inside of the Hingman Sims, Sims graph. All right, so have a, have, keep that in mind, that example, because uh, there's a follow-up. I guess this is inspired by a theorem of Bill Martin. So Bill Martin took that result of Cameron Hutales and Seidel from before, he gave an elementary proof of it, and then he applied it to uh, symmetric designs. So from a symmetric design, he'd get the incidence graph and he would get association schemes um, for those incidence graphs, for those particular symmetric designs, and he would apply that uh, generalized intersection result I spoke of just before. And so following his theme, uh, Jesse and I, uh, so Jesse Lansdowne, who I mentioned uh, is a PhD student, is just about to finish. Um, and this result is basically a culmination of this theory. And it, you'll see a number of corollaries soon, which mean a lot of the work that I've done in my career has become redundant because of this theorem. So, <laughs> so it's a, it's a it's a cool uh, result. Um, so I have an association scheme. And we've got a subset delta with the following property that we take some of our relations. So we've got a subset of them, S. And the characteristic vector of delta is restricted to a partial sum end of the eigen decomposition that I wrote down before. So instead of writing V naught all the way up to VD, we've got only some of the um, eigenspaces activated here. So it a, places a restriction on this set and that has some sort of combinatorial meaning. Now, if it also happens that over all of this set S, you have these crime parameters. So there's an H such that these crime parameters are zero. So think of uh, the easiest cases where S is size one. Okay, so if S is size one, then this is just the same, I and J are just the same, you know, Q11 is equal to zero, for instance, in the previous example. Then the theorem says that the set has half the size um, as the whole set. Now, this isn't, I am lying a little bit here. This isn't exactly the theorem. There is uh, an or as well. So one, one more thing could happen. It could, be, it could happen that you, um, your chi delta 
has to belong to a smaller summand, direct summand of eigenspaces, where we subtract H from this set S. So I guess what you need to think of is to make this theorem true, you have to make this S um, somehow minimal. Okay, so the sort of set S has to be um, uh, no smaller. You can't actually shove the characteristic vector of delta into a smaller part of the decomposition. And then this theorem is true. Okay, so uh, what time? Yeah, I should probably, I won't go, I was going to do the proof, but I'll skip that. Um, so in particular, if the set S is size one, this is sometimes called um, an intriguing set of type I. So that's what we have here. And um, they're also called Boolean degree one functions uh, in other areas of mathematics. And if QII is equal to zero, then what the theorem, what a corollary of the theorem is, is that an intriguing set of type I um, con contains exactly half um, half the vertices. Okay. So um, this means that we get one line proofs of a lot of old results. So Benjamino Segre in 1965 showed that if delta is an M ovoid of this elliptic quadric I showed you before, M ovoid is just a set of points that should every line meets in exactly M. This makes it into an intriguing set of, of some type, one or two. It doesn't matter what it exactly means here, but you can just work out the crime parameters for Q minus five Q and you get, you get that um, an M ovoid has to be a hemi system, which means it consists of half of the points. And actually you can generalize this to any, any generalized quadrangle, which has the same parameters as this example, because the Krein parameters only depend on the parameters of the generalized quadrangle. And so that's Cameron, Huttal and Seidel's results in 1978. Uh, then there was a, as I mentioned before, some results of mine become redundant one of them is with Melissa Lee in 2017. We had a similar result to Segre's, which is that if you have a rel relative M ovoid, uh, which was introduced by Pentiller and Williford, of Q minus five, Q minus Q four, Q a hyperplane section, whatever that means, and Q is even here, then this is also half the points. Um, another, and there's also another result, uh, I suppose also me and uh, uh, Klaus Metsch just recently, 2019. We have an intriguing set of type four, I think, one or four, I can't remember, but there's another th interesting thing in this geometry, which also is half the points. And there's a one line proof for that as well. Um, and then there's a uh, result of Jesse, me, uh, and Melissa Lee in 2018, also Frederick von Hover in 2011, we generalized his result. Um, we did, we wrote three pages of calculations to show that an M ovoid of certain regular near polygons, whatever they are, that they give you nice distance regular graphs and association schemes then they are also half the points. And again, we have a one line proof of that now because of this, um, this observation. So um, basically the idea is that these vanishing parameters, they are some, somehow a, a triple intersection number. And we've been just following the theme of Bill Martin's paper in 2001 of taking some combinatorial and geometric structures, finding an a nice association scheme for them and calculating their crime parameters and, and having our fingers crossed basically. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I think everyone can un unmute themselves and give us a clap. Cool. Thanks for the very nice talk, uh, John. Um, There's an yeah. open, um, videos. We have lots of time for questions and um, 
yeah, I think whoever wants to ask a question goes for it. That worked last two weeks ago, so I hope it's going to work again. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, well then, I guess it was very clear. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, yeah, um, but thank you very much. Um, I guess I could ask a question. Have you got anyone else's results you want to wipe out with this? Yeah, um, yeah, result, or do you think you've got them all? Yeah, that's a very good question. Mm. Uh, very good question. We're hard at work at trying to do that, actually. Uh, good. Yeah. Um, well, the other thing is that the there's more de there's a more general thing you can do than this. So that these, this is the sort of uh, the easy stuff, the low hanging fruit. But you could actually um, uh, the general what I have didn't mention is that this was uh, generalized in some respect to what's called semi definite programming, and people like Paul Terwilliger and Sylvia Hobart and people like that uh, extended the idea of just taking crime parameters to doing something a bit more uh, juicy using um, uh, interesting combinations of, of these EIs, I guess, to make other semi-definite matrices. Great. Cool. Thanks. So I've now got a quick question too, if that's all right. Um, uh, this may relate to what you just said, but um, is there any hope of proving something that um, using maybe similar methods, maybe not, that says that one of these intriguing, it gives a condition for one of these intriguing sets to be a third of your point set or a quarter or a tenth or that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, not that I know of, of, of hand, the, the one half thing turns up in the proof in a sort of clever way. Um, you get these cross terms and it's simply when you expand something where you multiply something by itself, you get twos out of the front of the cross terms. That's the reason why there's a half. Um, but a third and a quarter, well, there are, there are some things that are like, for example, Jordan Skillowart and I have this old project that's, that we've got to revive um, where we're trying to find something that's uh, Q plus one out of Q squared plus one. So it's not half, it's <laughs> some sort of square root Q or Q or fraction or something like that. But yeah, we want to show that an MO void is a Q plus one O void in a certain geometry. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Um, are there more questions? But this doesn't seem to be the case. And let's thank John again for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. What's it, who's up next? Uh, next is Fiona in two weeks. Oh, yes. Fiona, Fiona Skirman. Uh, one hour later, because it's going to be early in Europe. Ah, nice. Yep. Great. Cool. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Another, another Zoom meeting to go to in seven minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. thanks, John. All right. Thanks, Daniel.